Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first of a series of recorded notes on brain anatomy. I'm going to be in this next series of videos, I'm going to be taking you through some of the key structures of the brain uh, with special attention paid to the functions of the neuroanatomy that we're trying to learn. Um, the sheets that you've been provided to accompany these slides have some anatomical diagrams on them. It probably would be helpful as you're going through to pause the video and fill out those diagrams, labeling parts, maybe drawing in specific colors to identify certain structures. But we're going to pay special attention to what all of these parts actually do. Because in a psychology class, we're very much concerned about functional anatomy. Uh, of course, we want to understand where things are located, but we're really concerned with the impact of these structures and their functions on human behavior. Um, and that's the things I'm going to ask you about in the follow-up questions as well. So you want to be prepared to explain what these things do. So as we look at lower level brain structures, our first uh, topic or area of the brain we're going to concern ourselves with, um, first, you might notice these structures are labeled lower level brain structures in part because they are seated a little bit lower in the brain. Um, so their position in your cranium is actually lower than the cerebral cortex, for example, which sits up here. Um, but they're also given that term because they handle simpler functions. Uh, they tend to be involved in um, regulating bodily functions that are automatic in nature and important for um, automatic survival based kinds of things. So I would, if it were me, uh, looking at your anatomical diagrams, I would for sure fill out and label some of these parts that you're seeing here. Now this blue area in the diagram on the screen is just to indicate the, the pullout or like the hidden version of the brain stem that we're seeing here. Because the brain stem actually sits kind of jammed up uh, from this base where like the spinal cord bulges as it enters your skull uh, at the bottom here and then uh, is kind of covered over by other higher level brain structures. So it's not something that's all, the, all parts of it are not visible from the outside of a complete brain if you're looking at it. And of course, we've got the cerebellum tucked down here too. Um, so go ahead and label the cerebellum, which is this structure right here, the medulla, which is this bottom bulgy kind of part. Um, some of you might, especially if you're a fan of Adam Sandler movies, have heard this referred to as the medulla oblongata. Please don't trust the uh, information that's presented to you in Waterboy when concerning the function of brain parts. We'll address what that does in a moment. This kind of round central part in the middle of the brainstem is the pons. The top part of the brainstem, or at least we're going to talk about it in connection with the brainstem, is the thalamus, which is up here. And marked in blue on this diagram is a network of nerve fibers called the reticular formation. And again, if it was me, I might use a highlighter or something to mark that because on your black and white diagrams, um, it might not pop out for you. And later you might be wondering, like, okay, what the heck was that thing and why did I label it? Uh, this will take care of it. So you may remember from your textbook reading that, and I want to not hover over that so you can actually see the bottom. Um, this is sometimes referred to as the oldest part of the brain, these lower level brain structures, not because uh, they're wildly uh, different in age within your own body, but in an evolutionary sense, these are considered to be old brain structures in the sense that if we look back on the branches of the evolutionary tree, um, these appeared um, uh, among species that would later develop into humans. Um, but much earlier, so we share them with lots and lots of other organisms. So the, the brainstem and even component limbic system parts, uh, which we'll talk about in another video, uh, appear pretty similar across a lot of species of animals, including humans. So this is these are not structures that are super distinctive to humans. Uh, they're obviously important for our functioning, uh, but they're things that we share with a lot of other creatures. There are other parts that have much higher level abilities associated with them uh, that are a little bit more distinctively human. And of course, we'll come to those later on. So once you've got the parts of the brainstem labeled, let's just briefly address what each of these things do so you can understand how it's important to uh, our functioning. So this entire structure uh, that we're looking at right here, and we saw a pullout kind of of it on the previous slide, is the brainstem. If you were to characterize the entire uh, responsibility or the functions of the brainstem, you could loosely say they're involved with automatic survival based kinds of things. Um, one, probably the surest way to put uh, your continued survival in jeopardy is to 
uh, incur some sort of injury to the brainstem because these things are critically important to our normal everyday living and breathing kinds of functioning. Uh, and speaking of breathing, in fact, the structure down here, the medulla, um, one of its principal jobs is to regulate heartbeat and breathing. So um, in, when people sustain a traumatic head injury, um, if the medulla is damaged, that person is in most jeopardy of losing their life uh, because the uh, heart may not continue to beat on its own. It may go into dysregulation or not be beating at all. Um, and of course, that is the means by which the rest of the information coming in from the spinal cord would get passed along to higher level brain structures. Um, so it's also um, likely to render you potentially paralyzed or unable to feel the rest of your body uh, be because you're not able to pass on messages uh, between higher level structures in the brain and the rest of the body's uh, uh, nervous system. Um, breathing is also regulated by the medulla. So definitely, I mean, there's no real brain part that's like, you know, spare part, but if you were to have a brain part injured, I would pick not the medulla because <laughs> you probably wouldn't stay alive. Now, um, this structure right here is the pons. Unfortunately, your textbook doesn't do a lot of explaining of this, and I can actually understand why. Uh, the pons seems to be involved in many, many different kinds of things, um, and so it's hard to characterize this principal job. But in a moment, I'm actually going to click back to the previous slide so you can see where this is located in relation to some of the other structures. Pons is actually Latin for bridge, so this structure serves as a communication communication point between the cerebellum, which kind of sits immediately behind it in the brain, and areas of the cerebral cortex which surround it. Um, one of the things that AP psych students are especially likely to be asked about the PONS is its role in regulating sleep. Uh, there are some sleep disorders and sleep conditions where um, injuries or malfunctioning of the PONS causes dysregulation of one's sleep cycle. Um, so in fact, let's just take a look back again at where the PONS is located. So here's our brainstem. If we look at where this is seated within the brain, the pons is very close to the cerebellum and uh, to the rest of the cerebral cortex. So it has a lot of nerve fibers in it that connects both those higher level brain structures in the cerebral cortex and the cerebellum. So it does serve as a communication hub um, and that's why its uh, responsibilities sometimes get quite diverse as you're talking about things that, okay, if the pons is impaired, it might start impairing a lot of things. Um, well, there's a reason for that because it connects so many different areas of the brain. Um, now, the reticular formation, which runs the length of the brainstem here, uh, up and into the thalamus, um, is uh, the name given to a network of nerve fibers um, that runs throughout this structure. The net part of this actually might be helpful to remember because reticular actually means net-like. Um, there's uh, branches of nerve fibers that uh, run throughout this whole structure, and it does have some important jobs that, again, are kind of survival-based sorts of things. Um, one of them is controlling arousal and alertness levels. And here, when we mean arousal, we're not talking about maybe, like, you might think romantic arousal or something of that nature. When psychologists talk about arousal, they're talking about overall physiological activation. So um, are you alert? Um, is your heart beating fast or is it beating slow? Um, are you able to concentrate and focus or are you in more a dream-like state? That sort of thing. So uh, the example your textbook gives of this is that, okay, if you sever the reticular formation of a cat, it will lapse into a coma. Um, that seems like a mean thing to do, but it does illustrate something. Uh, coma is about the lowest level of arousal or alertness that someone can be at and still be alive. So if you've got severe dysregulation of arousal, we may have trouble maintaining consciousness. That would be something that would be caused by injury, damage, or dysfunction to the reticular formation. Now, the reticular formation also does play an important role in filtering incoming stimuli, especially stimuli from the rest of the body, um, and passing some of it onward to the thalamus where it may later then be presented to the cortex and might reach conscious awareness. Um, at any given moment we're bombarded by millions of pieces of sensory information. We can't attend to each one simultaneously and with the same um, uh, amount of effort. So the reticular formation kind of filters out stuff that might be unimportant or unchanging for us. Uh, so we don't have to pay attention to that. So the thalamus, which sits on top of the brain stem here, uh, has a cute nickname attached with it. It's referred to as the brain sensory switchboard. Um, what we mean by that 
is that the thalamus seems to be important in relaying sensory information from the sense organs um, and their uh, 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 accompanying nerve input. So for example, if you're hearing my recorded voice on this narration, um, that's stimulating your ears and a series of structures in there that eventually end up transforming the sound information into a neural impulse. That information is fed to your auditory nerve, which heads toward your brain. And it, before the information reaches the areas of the cortex that process that information, it first goes through the thalamus. So bef somewhere between ears and when you're consciously attending to that particular sound information, that uh, information has to pass through the thalamus. Same thing with vision. Uh, information passes from your eyes, then has to get routed through the thalamus before it goes to your occipital lobe where that information is ultimately processed. The one exception to this is your sense of smell. Uh, the part of your brain that processes smell information actually sits right behind your nasal cavity in your skull, um, so there's really no need for a middleman uh, to process that. The information goes right where it needs to. Now, our last on our whirlwind tour of the lower level brain structures is the cerebellum. You already labeled this on your diagram. I'm just giving you a different view of it here. So you can see the cerebellum kind of sits on the bottom of the brain beneath the rest of the cerebral cortex here. Um, and it has a couple important roles that we want to be familiar with. Um, for one, okay, it does go by the nickname the little brain, and that's in part because it does kind of look like a little brain shoved up underneath the rest of the brain. Um, it plays an important role in coordinating voluntary movement. Um, so your ability to dance um, or even walk in a coordinated fashion is in part because when those behaviors become automatic, they move to become processed by the cerebellum rather than conscious areas of your brain. Um, so when you can do stuff with automaticity and fluidity, that's usually because um, the cerebellum is now handling that task. And in fact, I'm going to post uh, along with this a link to a video that shows um, how that level of practice to the level of aut automaticness um, will uh, it involves your cerebellum and also involves like less processing effort with time. Um, so take a moment to check that out if you're interested. It's a cute cup stacking activity. Um, as we learned, however, in our last unit, the cerebellum does have some important roles in certain types of memories, um, particularly for procedural skills and for classically conditioned responses. So you might recall that these are implicit forms of memory, so not conscious memory processing, um, but types of uh, processing of memories that uh, for behaviors and actions that ultimately become automatic. So uh, that's going to close our brief tour of lower level brain structures. Uh, hopefully you got your diagrams filled out, and next I'd encourage you to move on to the limbic system.